A warm welcome to News Now on TV360 Nigeria. I am Fidelia Aguncha. An Imo State High Court sitting in the state capital, Owerri, has declared the impeachment of Aze Madamiri, a former deputy governor of the state, as illegal. Madamiri was impeached on July 30, 2018, nearly two months after the Imo State House of Assembly set up a panel to investigate his actions. He was accused of gross misconduct and abandoning his duties and office for a long time. The impeachment notice was passed by 19 out of 37 members of the Imo House of Assembly, despite a state high court restraining the lawmakers from proceeding with the impeachment process. The same court has now set aside the impeachment. Now, in his ruling, the judge, Justice Benjamin Ihiakad, criticized the chief judge of the state, Pascal Nadi, and the attorney general of the state, Militus Lemadim, for not following the provisions of the 1999 constitution as amended in the impeachment of Madamiri on July 31, 2018. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, says the allegation that uncollected permanent voters' cards are being released ahead of the Oshun rerun election is baseless. Rotimi Oyekomi, Chief Press Secretary to INEC Chairman, was reacting to allegations raised by the Coalition of United Political Parties, COP. The COP had alleged that INEC has refused to make public the list of people with permanent voters' cards in the affected local government areas because it plans to announce a fictitious figure of uncollected PVCs. The coalition also alleged that a conspiracy was being spearheaded by some unnamed national officers of the commission. Oyekomi has now asked the coalition to provide proof. The ruling All Progressives Congress, APC, has cautioned the national chairman of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, Uche Secundus, over his use of political language and conduct. APC spokesperson Yakini Nabena advised Secundus not to descend to the level of unexpected the level unexpected of his office. His warning comes after the PDP and its national chairman accused the APC of rigging the Oshun elections. The banner says the APC will ignore the comments because they are irresponsible and baseless utterances. Now, still on the Oshun elections, Nigerians have continued to react to the outcome of the polls. Lawyers and political analysts shared divergent views on the matter. TV360's Tunji Oye has this report from Abuja. Another logjam in the political space of the country. That was Saturday's governorship election in Osho State that was declared inconclusive by the Independent National Electoral Commission, Hynek. Expectedly, lawyers, political analysts and Nigerians are reacting to the decision of Hynek. We are watching to see what they are going to do in comes 27 September. But I just pray that they will not try anything that would look funny. They should continue the spirit they started because we saw this election as the most peaceful election ever held in the state. The Oshu governorship election was peaceful. No rancor. There was no problem. Then ex Nigerians expecting to see that a governor is pronounced winner or one of the contestants is pronounced winner. The next thing we had is inconclusive. Somebody scored that number of votes. Then there are a number of votes rejected. There are a number of votes that are not counted. What I'm trying to tell you is that the INEC is doing a job now that people are praising, but they are already derailing. We'll just give INEC a trial or leave them to do their work by giving them chance, since they have already mentioned that come on Thursday, that they will try to conclude the election by declaring the winner. The situation has thrown up another contradiction between the electoral act and the constitution. And on this, lawyers are sharply divided. If we look at the constitution, 
Section 179 sub 2 provides that a candidate for an election into the office of a governor of a state shall be deemed to have been a duly elected where there being two or more candidates a he has the highest number of votes cast at the election and b he has not less than one quarter of all the votes cast in each of at least two thirds of all the local government areas in the state what we have now is that there need to be a clear understanding of the relationship and the synergy between the INEC guidelines and the constitutional provision. How the court will interpret it is a matter of evidence. It's, a, it's an entirely different question. Whether the court will support or agree with INEC or not is an entirely different thing. Well, as it is, it is an obvious clash between the provision of the constitution and other laws, particularly in respect to this case matter in Ocean State gubernatorial election. It's so clear. The constitution made INEC as the umpire, electoral empire in Nigeria. It's an agency that oversees elections in Nigeria fine. And as an empire, the constitution even empowers the INEC based on some things to make some regulations, some guidelines. Good. But as it is today, for INEC to now use the guidelines of 2015 that talks about inconclusiveness, about the voided votes, to override the position of the constitution, then I think there is a danger. It is dangerous, it is absurd, and such things should not, have, should not be allowed. The election has been rescheduled for 27 September, and Nigerians are hoping the polls will be concluded this time. From Abuja, Sunjoye, TV360 News. The All Progressives Congress, APC, has rescheduled its presidential primary election for a third time. The primary will now hold on Friday, September 28. The latest postponement comes barely 24 hours after Nabena announced the rescheduling of the election from September 25 to September 27. Nabena says the recent shift was to avoid a clash with the Oshun governorship rerun election fixed for September 27. The party had last week shifted the election from September 20 to September 25. Meanwhile, the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tuka Baratai, has warned Nigerian Army personnel not to be partisan in the discharge of their duties. The Army Chief says soldiers should be careful with their relationship with politicians, especially ahead of the 2019 general elections. He says the Army will not hesitate to discipline any erring soldier. As political activities unfold towards the 2019 general elections, general officers commanding and field commanders at all levels are enjoined to continue to remind officers and soldiers under their command to remain non-partisan and be guided by the stipulated conduct, conduct, code of conduct in the discharge of their duties. Be rest assured, politicians would like to approach you. You are advised to strictly desist and resist such approaches, especially where it has to do with partisanship. As professional soldiers, none of us should be sympathetic to any political religious or ethnic cause. Any personnel of the Nigerian Army who is interested in politics, as I mentioned much, much earlier, should voluntarily retire from the Nigerian Army to pursue his or her political passion. The Trade Union Congress has insisted that organized labor will go ahead with its planned strike action on September 27 in protest of the federal government's failure 
to approve a new minimum wage. The Secretary General of the Union, Mosul Lawal Ozigi, says that the decision to embark on the strike was sequel to the resolve of the Central Working Committee of the TUC on September 24. Ozigi says that following the mandate of the committee, the TUC leadership would take all necessary action to effect the ultimatum on the new minimum wage in collaboration with other stakeholders. The TUC warning comes as after the United Labour Congress also maintained it will join the strike action. The body's president, Joe Ajaro, says the government has yet to show commitment to meeting your demands on the minimum wage of workers in Nigeria. Nigeria will remember that in May this year, we raised alarm when the Minister of Labour said categorically that there will be no new national minimum wage before the end of September this year. This was, however, denied by the federal government. But with this latest gambit, our worst fear concerning the government's motives over the national minimum wage has been confirmed. That the federal government has remained immune to the suffering and wanton deprivations which its policies and actions have brought upon the working people of this country. This government is demonstrably not worried about the increasing poverty in the country, which has since last year made Nigeria the country with the largest number of poor people all over the globe. It is not therefore surprising that it does not think of how to lift Nigerians out of this morass. The government has shown by its actions and remarkable lack of seriousness which recently may have characterized governance in Nigeria, that, they, that we therefore wish to reaffirm our commitment to pursue the attainment of our collective demand for 65,000 Naira monthly as the new national minimum wage for all Nigerian workers as harmonized by organized labor. That we recommit to the 14-day ultimatum issued to the federal government that as a result of this apparent disregard, we shall, in conjunction with other labor centers, working with civil society organizations across Nigeria, embark on a nationwide action, if nothing is done, to meet our demands on the expiration of this collective ultimatum in the next few days. In health, the executive director of the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, Faisal Shaibu, has emphasized the need for Nigeria to have an, an accountable framework for the management of the primary health care system. Shaibu says accountability is necessary following Javi Board's approval to extend support to Nigeria in the area of immunization. On her part, the representative of WHO, Fiona Baraka, called on the Nigerian government to develop high-level two-year strategy in ensuring that optimum result is obtained in the health sector, while the representative of Javi urged the Nigerian government to ensure that vaccines are put to use and also to ensure sustainability of the immunization process even after the exit of Javi. When polio was declared a global emergency, we rallied round set up EOCs and did some amazing piece of work that has driven polio to perhaps just one or two LGAs, if it still exists. We found it within ourselves to do that type of amazing work. When Ebola came calling, we pulled our resources together again. The common thread of all these times in public health where we stood head and shoulders above water was the fact that everybody was held accountable. But when you look back, do we still have all those tenets in our system? I'm afraid not. As partners, we believe Nigeria can turn the tide with the opportunities that are presented at hand. It's very critical that this be done to mitigate the consequences of vaccine-preventable diseases on health and the associated economic loss to the country. We are pleased with the timing of this meeting immediately following the joint appraisal last week 
We've, we see these processes as complementary. We were able to identify key challenges, key priorities for the program moving forward last week, and we hope that we'll build on that process to come up with an operational plan for the next two years. I'm here to say that Gavi is fully committed uh, to be with you. Uh, we are very proud that the board has taken that decision. However, to also tell you that Gavi Secretariat is not an easy place. We are caught between a rock and a hard place. We want to be there, we want to support you, we want to ensure that the context you're working in is clearly understood by everyone, and especially the policy makers at our board. But we also want to make sure that you're working with us with the same scheme and in the most efficient ways to ensure that we can also give that great representation uh, at the board to ensure that uh, the partnership continues and that we continue to uh, be an effective partner for the coming 10 years. We'll take a short break now and return shortly. Stay with us. Corruption not in my country. Um, what's your name? Onosu de Omorifi. May we check? Your own discourse, the least with the outside. Or not say that your name never had deal. Your name is Honorio De. You even went as a fashion designer. As you don't come back, so, eh? Now, I won't go as Akoburi over here. And we won't go as pilots. That is impersonation. My own share for the national cake be that. Mr. Onoso De. Mm -mm. Akoburi. The amnesty program is an intervention project for sustainable economic development of the Niger Delta, which you are a beneficiary of, lying under pretext for your selfish gain and advantage, is robbing others of the same opportunity. And that is an act of corruption, not in my country. Uh. Corruption, not in my country. Stop corruption now. Glad to have you back. Let's now focus on the business segment of the news with Esther Vese. Hello, Esther. Hi, Fidelia. So what do you have for us today, Esther? Well, actually, Standard Bank says CBN may review its decision to penalize its West African unit for allegedly breaking the law in helping South African mobile phone company MTN send money abroad. The Stambik IBTC Bank is one of four banks that the Central Bank of Nigeria alleged helped MTN illegally repatriate $8.1 billion. The new possible review comes a few days after the Central Bank says additional information from MTN may lead to an equitable resolution helping shares in the South African wire phone operator rebound. Now, Stambik IBTC was fined 1.8 billion naira, that's 5.9 million dollars, for its role in sending the money abroad. The CBN also fined Standard Chartered 2.4 billion naira, the highest of the, of the fine, Citibank 1.2 billion naira, and Diamond Bank 250 million naira, the least of the fine. And now the, the Pan Niger Delta firm has kicked against the planned sale of the Belema oil field, that's the OML25, by Shell Petroleum Development Company to Cresta Nigeria Limited. The group, led by Ijo leader Edwin Clark, insisted on the div divestment of the oil field to an indigenous firm, saying it would resist moves by the multinational oil company to sell it to a foreign corporate entity. Now, he wants the federal government to address the matter with urgent priority and grant Niger Delta indigents and state governments who were interested the right of first refusal on the renewal and award of all licenses. It is quite unfortunate that oil companies, as simplified by Shell, has failed to give due regard and attention to the Niger Delta oil and gas communities and their lands. Over the years, they have not only exploited their resources and degraded their lands, they have also taken advantage of the people, inducing unnecessary crises and conflicts. Obviously, Shell has not learned anything from the consequences of their actions in the past, that had led to several crises in host communities of Niger Delta, particularly the Ogoni crisis that has resulted in the eventual locking up of the Ogoni oil wells for over 20 years now. The oil fields, the oil mills, that are due 
for reassigning must be assigned to indigents of Niger Delta. And Niger Delta indigents must give, be given right of first refusal. And that is what we are saying here today. And what has been said here in essence is that it must be told loud and clear to everyone and to Shell and to NNPC and to the federal government that opportunities must be given must be given to indigents of the region. And that opportunity we are asking for is what we refer to as the right of first refusal. We issued a statement some time ago that the president, the government was losing money. The state government was losing money. They should do something to settle this problem. But what did they do? They decided to intimidate the people, harass them, by driving them from their, where they were. Some of them have been killed, injured. And the local council, local government council, thinking that they'll be, able, they'll be helping the shell, shell company joined, brought even thugs to attack the innocent people. Is that what we stand for? Is that, is that our gain? That we live in our home? Because oil is found in our backyard, we have become criminals, we become agitators, troublemakers, that's what they call us. Well, meanwhile, global oil prices hit a four-year high on Tuesday amid looming U.S. sanctions against Iran and an apparent reluctance by OPEC and Russia to raise output to offset the expected to heat to supply. Brent crude features rose to $81.69 a barrel shortly, while U.S. crude features were at $72.28 a barrel. The United States from November 4 will target Iran's oil exports with sanctions and Washington is putting pressure on governments and companies around the world to fall in line and cut purchases from Tehran. Iran. Well, the U.S. President Donald Trump says also demanded that OPEC and Russia increase their supplies to make up for the expected shortfall in Iranian exports. OPEC and Russia, however, have so far rebuffed such calls. Now we're going to turn our focus to the trading session for on the equities market today. While well, closing Tuesday's trading session with the bulls returning to the market, the Nigerian Stock Exchange recorded a 2.08% rise in major market indicators. The All Share Index and market capitalization inched up a little further to close at over 33,000 basis points and a little over 12 million naira. Now, recording the highest increase in terms of sectors were the consumer goods sector, the banking sector, I'm going to mention only three, and the insurance sector. But the oil and gas sector, however, was the only sector in the negative territory. Now, today's gainers were led by Nestle, Dangote Cement, International Bureaus, and Stambik IBTC. And apparently, CBN's decision to review its earlier resolution on the penalty placed on Stambik IBTC following submissions of documents by bank and the possibility of it not being debited for $2.632 billion was good news for investors as they closed the market with more buys than sell-offs. Now, with its share price rising at 4 0.76%. Now, on a loser's chart, we have Total, Mobile, Presco, and Zenith Bank. What's interesting about Zenith Bank, you'll get to know real soon, is that on our top traders table, we have Zenith Bank being a top trader. This means that for the 43.282 million shares traded, and it's coming back to be in the red, this means that a majority of the transactions made on Zenith Bank today were sell-ups. That's why we see most of the trade from Zenit Banks actually were sell-off. So this doesn't necessarily mean it's a good news for the company. Also on our top traders was International Bureaus with over a billion hour worth of shares traded, UBA and Fidelity Bank. Now for a volume, total volume of shares traded in today's session was over 222 million and a value 3.283 billion and of which International Bureaus 
um, contributed one over a little over one billion naira. And for deals, we have three thousand three hundred and twenty-seven. Yesterday, we had a little over two thousand deals. Now, if we take a quick look at the global stock market, we'll see that both the London the global stock market, rather, and the Nigerian, um, Nigerian stock exchange closed today's trading session in the greens. We have FTSE, that's the London Stock Exchange, Dow Jones, the American Stock Exchange, and Nikkei, the Asian Stock Exchange, also closed in the greens. So we're all in the greens today, Fidelia. Wow, thanks for that update, Esther. So all in the greens, um, we look forward to good news. But I actually think we haven't heard the last of the issue with MTN, CBN, and the four banks that were fined. Definitely not. But hopefully we'll see whether they are going to decide to resolve the fine they put on the Stambik IBTC. And we'll see. You get to hear more news on the other three banks that were fined. Wow, thank you so much, Esther. Still to come, the Ebola outbreak in Congo just might worsen. But we'll look at more after this break, to stay with us. Corruption not in my country. Uh -huh. What do you want Small baskets. I want plantain. Eh. Uh, but why your plantain can't hard like this? Ah, why? madam, eh, now the outside hard. Inside there, it is very soft. Water, water. <laughs> madam, wallahi, make her no buy Make her show you something. <laughs> what? What in be this one? Madam, this one, now the chemical water they put on for the plantain, make her ripe up. Eh? So you they put chemical for plantain where people go chop. No water, no be chemical. But that... no water. You know, say Pela, I don't talk and say water and no be enemy. Drink them. Where are collect that water drink them? Yeah, I just stop, finish. See my belly. I from it don't big. I just stop drink water, finish. Where I don't drink Where are you drink them now? I they sell them plantain, I go come put them for chemical because I want to make a ripe go. Uh -huh. That one I talk and now corruption. Corruption. No be for this a kaswa, come no be for this a country. Now me take them. Corruption not in my country. Stop corruption now. Thanks for staying with us. The World Health Organization, WHO, says an Ebola outbreak in northeastern Democratic Republic of Congo may worsen rapidly owing to attacks by armed groups, community resistance and the geographic spread of the disease. At least 100 people have died in the outbreak out of 150 cases in North Kivu and Ituri provinces. Attacks by armed opposition groups had increased in severity and frequency, especially those attributed to the Alliance of Democratic Forces, most dramatically an attack that killed 21 in the city of Beni, where the WHO's operation is based. The city has declared a vow morte, a period of mourning on two at least Friday, obliging WHO to suspend its operations. Ethiopian authorities say it has arrested more than 1,200 people after violence erupted in and around the capital this month, a senior police official said. The head of the capital's police commission, Dek Fibedi, said 28 people died, raising the death count from 23. Violence that raged from September 12 to 17 and included attacks on minorities in Ethiopia's ethnic Oromo heartland outside Addis Ababa, was a blow to new reformist Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's effort at reconciliation. In sports, FIFA is set to reintroduce licenses for player agents and has adopted in principle a limit on player loans. FIFA's Football Stakeholders Committee approved the introduction of licenses and exams for agents at a meeting in London. The governing body of World Football did away with agent licenses in 2015, while the committee approved a limit on player loans but could not agree a number. FIFA had proposed a maximum of six loans per club as part of plans to reduce the stockpiling of players by leading clubs. Sunderland have announced the termination of Didier Ndong's contract after he provided no reason for his absence from the club since July. The 24-year-old joined the English League One side in a club record fee of 1.6 million euros in August 2016 on a five-year deal from French League One side Laurent and made 49 appearances for the side, scoring just one goal. In January, the midfielder signed for Premier League side Watford on loan with an option of making the deal permanent, but after an unimpressive stint, the Hornets allowed him to leave. Former Manchester United striker 
Guseb Rossi is set to face a hearing with Italy's anti-doping agency Nado Italia next month after failing a drug test. The 31-year-old free agent tested positive for dozolamide, a drug that can usually be found in anti-glaucoma medication following the Syria art clash between Genoa and Benevento on May 12. A one-year ban has been suggested for the attacker, who has reportedly denied ever taking eye drops, which is how this drug is usually administered. Well, that's all on tonight's bulletin. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I am Fidelia Agoncha. Bye for now.